Hey, what's good everybody? It is Deltre, and today we are doing something a little bit different. Something that is long overdue for, from me in this channel, in all honesty, especially considering that a lot of you guys who have been around for a while probably already know that I am some kind of oddball who actually enjoys the Shadows of Valentia gameplay. Now let me be clear, if you hate Echoes and everything that there is to do with its gameplay, I do not expect in the slightest that this video is going to change your mind. This is more for people who were sort of on the fence. You know, people who maybe saw some good, but saw some bad as well. This might help give you a different perspective that might make the game more enjoyable for you if you ever try to go back and play it again. Now this video itself is actually going to be more of a podcast style thing, so you can just leave it on in the background for the most part. There is going to be a little bit of video footage at one point or another. I, I don't know when it's going to be edited in yet. I'm sure it will be apparent when it happens. Uh, to be clear, I do not have a good way to record Shadows of Valentia, so the quality of the video is going to be less than the standard, to say the least. Especially if you're already familiar with other playthroughs on YouTube or my channel or anything like that. But this is the best way I have to make this point, and it literally did need to be this footage for reasons that we will see. Now, I want to focus mostly, if not entirely, on the gameplay aspects of Shadows of Valencia for this video, but I would still like to take a few seconds to fanboy for a second if you don't mind. And I just have to say, out of everything that people love about Echoes, my personal favorite has got to be the art style. Just every time I replay it, I always seem to find a new detail or something to appreciate. Personally, I think the monster designs are probably the best part of it, because I can seriously remember getting chills late at night going through Alm's trial so he could prove himself as a competent warrior and encountering the Death Goals for the first time. Those are some wild looking monsters, man. <laughs> but the details of your player characters are really insane too. For example, did you notice the fact that just about everybody who wears armor has battle damage? You can see that in their actual portraits and that is just so cool. Except for Myson for some reason who has almost no battle damage of any kind as if he's some kind of ultimate warrior who can just breeze through 99% of any enemy that he would ever face on the battlefield. And I, I just thought that was such a cool detail. But at any rate, like I said, this is going to be 90% gameplay, so let's get to that. Before I go any further though, I feel that I should probably explain what it is that you are seeing, besides the obvious, right? Clearly, this is not the highest quality. Regardless, I wanted to use the footage that I did because I'm going to use it in order to make a larger point about how it is exactly that people perceive this game and how it is exactly that people understand this game. Now, what you are seeing right now on screen is the resulting turn counts from the time that I decided to sit down and really figure out how Echoes worked. This is not the lowest possible turn count. And this video is not going to be nothing but my turn counts, you know what I mean? No, I want to use this to make a greater point, which I will get into after we're done talking about this real quick. So, for those who are curious, the final turn count for this entire playthrough, including map spawns, uh, other battles that are not listed for some reason in the final turn count crawl, that, that's something that really annoys me about this game, I have to be honest. Uh, this playthrough is quite old. So, in any case where I was unsure with 100% certainty what the turn count would be, I highballed it instead, just so that this could be as accurate as possible. Also note that I never took a random battle for this for any reason. If I was in a dungeon and I got caught, well it's back to the drawing board for that run, man. The final turn count for all of that is 215 turns. The lower bound for this route that I used is somewhere between 190 to 195 turns. Now the reason I even mention any of this is because I, at this point I am well aware that my experience with this game is not even remotely in the ballpark <laughs> to anybody else's experience with this game, not that I have seen at any rate. I imagine that a lot of people who are watching this hear the final result and say how the hell, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's how sure I am that a lot of what I'm about to say has not really been brought to the attention of many before this point. Now let me be clear, I do not think that this is the perfect game. I most certainly do not. But I've come to understand that there are a huge number of misconceptions about this game, whether this is the first Fire Emblem game that you played, 
or whether you played every other game in the series. Your amount of experience with other titles is really not going to help you in this game, not that much. Shadows of Valencia is an entirely different beast all unto itself. There are fundamentals that can be applied across every game in the series, and some of those do apply to this game as well, but for the most part, You'd do way better to abandon any kind of previous Fire Emblem knowledge when going into this game because it's not going to... It's not going to impact your experience. It's really just not. You're going to have to adapt to this game specifically and play by its own set of rules to have any real kind of success in this title. Believe me when I say that my first playthrough looked absolutely nothing like this because I was so focused on everything I already knew about Fire Emblem going into it rather than paying attention to what it is that the game was trying to teach me about itself. That said, I think it would be best to start with the bad. The bad of this game is Act 1, without a doubt. Act 1 is horrible, probably one of the biggest turnoffs that you could ever give to a player. Like, I I'm just admitting that straight up. If you played through Shadows of Valencia and thought the whole game was going to be like Act 1, and you played the whole game as if it were Act 1, I can tell you right now that I perfectly understand why you would be so frustrated with this game. Act 1 it is... Oh, it's just... It's really bad. It's really bad. Enemies are just... Oh, they're too bulky for anybody but magic users to really do anything. Hit rates are awful. And it's just, ugh, it's, it's a really bad experience, I'm not gonna lie. Act 1 is just dreadful, especially when it comes to the finale of Act 1. You don't have any way to mitigate a lot of these problems because you can't forge. It's totally out of the question to raise a whole team of mages. That's gonna just hurt you in the long run. And I think that even a first-time player would never, ever consider doing something like that unless you were just memeing it up or something, but... It seems as if the game expects you to have a lot better ways to deal with the scenarios in which it, in which it places you. But you can't. You can't, because that's going to hurt you for the rest of the game. So Act 1 is a, it's a huge loser in my opinion. They should have really paid a lot closer attention to what it is that you were actually capable of if you were trying to raise an efficient team. And Act 1 just unfortunately does not do a very good job of creating a strong first impression. Another thing that I really wish had been cleaned up a lot more is the forging system. Not necessarily the system itself, just the way that it's actually presented to the player. For a first time player, you are never going to have a whole lot of success with choosing what to forge because the game is very unclear about what it is that you're actually getting out of each progressive forge, if that makes sense. When I try to evolve a weapon, for example, into a different one, I don't have any idea what I'm actually going to get out of that exchange until I have the new weapon in my hands. There's no preview, it doesn't give you any kind of indication as to what the new stats will be, it doesn't give you any kind of indication as to what sort of combat arts you might be learning, it's just very unclear. The only way you could ever reasonably parse this kind of information for yourself is to use some kind of online walkthrough or strategy guide, which just shouldn't be a requirement for such a pivotal feature. The only other real alternative to get through this in-game is to constantly reset when you make a bad trade like that, and that's not something that a lot of players are going to do. A lot of players, especially the first time they play, are just going to take whatever they can get, man. It's really unreasonable to expect people to not only need to master this new system, but also not give them the information that they need to do so. The third thing that I wish would have been cleaned up a little bit, without a doubt, is the fact that almost every combat art is useless. I, I won't say useless, but I will say unnecessary. They're only really for style points, for the most part. There is one combat art that is actually really good <laughs> that nobody's going to predict before I actually get to that, but for the most part, the best combat arts are all utility based. Things like swap and shove are the ones that you will be using for the most part if you're trying to beat the game as effectively as possible. In fact, there's no weapon exclusive combat art, so that'd be like whatever combat art the steel sword teaches you. Sunder, I think it's called. That's not a very useful skill. Rat Strike's not a very useful skill from the iron sword. None of the swords have really particularly good combat arts. 
Uh, none of the weapons, period, have particularly good combat arts. And that is disappointing. I wish they would have been more useful. Oh, of course. <laughs> Hello, the elephant in the room, right? The killer bow. The killer bow obviously has a fantastic combat art, but that one's just in a league of its own. That one's in a league of its own. Oh, uh, Fudroyan from the Lightning Sword is also reasonably usable. Uh, similarly, Thunderclap from the Lightning Sword has some niche use just for that extra point of range on it. As for the rest of the weapons, though, I think they would have done much better to actually ensure that there would be a worthwhile reason to ever click any of those combat arts in any scenario. The last thing that I rather dislike about this game is the fact that it doesn't ever actually force you to learn how to play it. Hon honestly, that's just the reality of it. It never actually actively makes you learn the rules and systems in place. It never actually goes out of its way to make you understand how it is that you can play this game effectively and therefore increase your enjoyment of this game. I understand that this game allows you to breeze through 90% of it without even putting in a single modicum of work, really. I've seen people have success with the auto battle feature. Now, how the hell do you design a game that can literally beat itself? What kind of sense does that make? No, no, no. There should be no excuse for that. It should somehow be able to teach you its own rules without you, the player, having to go out of your way to try and master the systems all on your own. It should give you enough groundwork and understanding through the natural progression of the gameplay. I'm pretty happy with how my last playthrough of this game turned out, but I would never tell you that it's how you need to play this game. Absolutely not. It never forces you to do anything even remotely like this. I can tell you that it is way, way, way more enjoyable when you actually take the time to understand every little thing that's going on. Oh yeah, this was the most fun I ever had playing Echoes, and I already kind of liked the game, so that should tell you something. But bottom line, if the game isn't going to force people to have fun with it, then in some respects it has failed, in my opinion. Take a game like Conquest, which constantly forces you to play by its own strict set of rules, and most people, regardless of how they feel about the story or any other elements, would agree that it's a fun experience because the game actually makes you go out and have that fun. It makes you go out and figure out how to triumph over these challenges effectively. And it's very much the game making you do that, especially on higher difficulties, because if you don't, you will die. There's really no such situation in this game. You can play it effectively. There are ways to do it, and... I mean, I, I think we've gotten past the turn counts and everything by now. But you can blast through something like Celica's Act 3 and Celica's Act 4 in just a, such a short amount of time. Way shorter than anything that I did on my first playthrough. Way shorter than anything I'm sure most players do. And I, I'm sure a lot of players wished they realized this. Considering that's often cited as one of the worst parts of the game. And if the game would actually teach the player that they are capable of going above and beyond with what the game has given them that I imagine the experiences of a lot of players would be very different. Now the good. Fire Emblem Echoes, unlike any other Fire Emblem game in the series, really rewards you for using everybody at all times because there is free deployment at all times. Don't get me wrong. An effective playthrough of any Fire Emblem title is going to ensure that all of your unit slots are filled up with people who can accomplish something. However, in Echoes, every little bit helps every little bit helps. I imagine that in the footage by now we have started to reach the portion where it shows win-loss ratios and things like that. So I'd like you to take special notice of how many battles characters get, how many victories they get, and with that I want you to understand that the amount of victories in this game aren't really everything. Not really. You could look at just about any other Fire Emblem title see the end game win losses and have a pretty good idea of how important each character was throughout the entire game. It would be very, very close to whoever has the highest wins or whatever. Those would be your best units, without a doubt. However, in Echoes, that is not the case. There's a multitude of reasons for that. The main one being that it is very difficult for one person to do 
anything all by themselves. It's actually much less efficient to do things that way because you're essentially wasting your free deployment when you do that. I'm not sure if we quite got to Bowie just yet, but I think he would be the ultimate example of this. Most people would see Bowie and say, oh, there's a bad unit. I see Bowie and say, there's a chip god. No lie. Bowie ended up with like 60 battles somehow or something like that. Whereas I believe Gray ended up with like 140 or something. And I think he was the person who actually ended up seeing the most combat, but it was either him or Cliff at, at any rate. The point being that if you're not trying to have every character contribute something on every map, then you're hurting your overall team. Because you're putting more weight and more stock on things like growth rates or spending outrageous amounts of money on items that you don't really need for the long term. And that's just going to make for a much more frustrating experience. Imagine being a newer player or a player who doesn't really fully understand what this game requires of you and wasting a whole bunch of money on something that you actually don't see that much benefit from because you could have just used some other characters who didn't have very important tasks to do in order to help you make up any kind of difference in power between two weapons. Now you can argue that yes it is in fact possible to start having more characters fly solo once you roll around to Act 4 and that is true. That is true, but let's not forget the 75-80% to 80 of the game where that was just a no-go. Where that was completely impossible due to the game's own rules. And even then, I could practically name off right now every single map where the whole thing is defeated by a smaller selection of characters. And by smaller, I mean about half. About half the deployment slots as opposed to the vast majority, if not all, characters being useful. And just to prove it, the ones that I'm thinking about are the end of Act 3 Berselica. That one, Leon, if you do things the way that I did, will trivialize so hard that some of your backline units won't have time to catch up, basically. Uh, he's, he's promoted by this point, but we can get to that in the next video. There is the Dead Man's Mire, where it's the swamp, so it's not so much that your characters are useless, it's just that they would much prefer to spend time advancing your better units uh, by using things like shove and swap. So they were still useful, just not necessarily for combat. The same sort of situation with the Dolph's Keep map, where again, the characters are still useful, but it's more for utility things. Now of course, in these cases, Characters who do not have particularly unique utility and have to rely on combat don't do as hot. But you're still more than able to find a use for just about every single character. And even on these maps, you could end up using some of those lesser units as well, depending on things such as Cantors and how many summons they decide to spawn, basically. As for the rest, though, I'm, I'm really struggling to think of too many maps where not everybody was used. In fact, as compared to Celica, Almsroud is much better about this in my opinion. Because it is just that much easier to have everybody do something on every map. But even in the desert with Celica, it wasn't really that bad as long as you... Ah, uh, we, we'll leave that for the next one. I don't want to get too far off topic here now. So yes, it is true that eventually... Characters can strike out on their own and be able to accomplish things as they may be able to in another Fire Emblem game. Bottom line, this game expects you to have an army, not a one-man army. And I don't really think that you can say that about too many other games in the series. Granted, yes, Matilda is broken out the game, but it's really just her. It really is. And considering my new perspective on this game, I, I would almost argue that she's not even the best unit in the game. She's certainly the most capable of holding up to traditional Fire Emblem preconceptions, right? That whole low manning thing that a lot of people really place a lot of value on. Matilda is capable of that to an extent. I'm really struggling to think of too many other characters that even come close to her. And she can't be everywhere at once, no matter how you slice it. As good as she is, she's gonna need some help, and that means using the rest of this colorful cast of characters. Which is exactly why I think that this is such a huge benefit to Shadows of Valencia over every other game. Not only can you use just about every character at all times, 
not only is just about every character useful for something, but the game actually rewards you for doing it for once, instead of just low manning with a small selection of a huge cast. Could you imagine a game where Meg is somehow useful in any respect? No, of course not. She would never see the 60 rounds of battle or whatever that Bowie saw, because she's just not a useful unit. Now, I'm not going to say that there are no losers in this game. There's a handful, a small selection. Somebody like Forsyth isn't particularly great, and the game seems to outright hate Valbar because I can't really think of much of anything for him to do. <laughs> but not only does the game reward you for using a large amount of characters, it actually tries to teach you that this is a pretty decent option. Now for as much crap as I gave Act 1, you do have to spend the majority of that combining for your kills, which teaches you right from the start that it's much more effective to use everybody to function as a team rather than to try and kill everybody with one single character. Not only that, it pushes you even a little bit further in that direction because just seeing battle in this game can account for such a huge amount of experience. If you take a character like Mei, I'm pretty sure she's come up by now, but she had about 90 battles and only 25 kills. Well, I'm looking at her right now and she actually ended the game nearly a level 11 on less than 30 kills and she starts at level 1. So the game definitely rewards you for just having your character see battle. The bonus experience system is another way that you are rewarded for using a large number of characters. Even characters who aren't seeing as much fighting as the rest of your better units can still earn experience that way so it's always worthwhile to at least have them do something especially if they're sitting at 99 experience after bonus experience. That way you can raise them up and hopefully catch a promotion even if they don't necessarily put the entire team on their back in every battle. Somebody like Lucas who you saw had 33 battles or so, uh, he's a really good example of that. I was able to promote him to a knight without really having him do too, too much of anything. Like he's, I'm looking at it right now, he's about level 3, he's 2 in 99. He's level 2 at 99 experience. And most of that came from just having him fight things and the bonus experience so that by the time I needed a character with really high defenses like that to pull off a strategy, well guess what? He was able to do it because the game allows me to do it. It allows me to do it and expects me to do it. Like I say, the game wants you to use a decent variety of characters here. And there are systems in place to make this possible. In fact, experience is one of the more important things about this game to understand. Understanding how experience works, understanding how to best get experience, etc, etc. But I want to save that one for the next video anyways, because it seems to make a little bit more sense to me that way, right? Keep all the finer details in the same video. The second thing that I like that is going to have 90% of people think I'm insane is how well the maps in this game seem to complement the abilities of your team. Now before you click off this video immediately after leaving that dislike, let me actually explain. So warp and rescue are free resources. There's no associated cost to using them besides the HP pool of whatever cleric you may be using, be it Silk or Tatiana, whatever. So with that in mind, the fact that the maps don't lend themselves to being easily trivialized in the same way that, say, a map in Shadow Dragon might be, means that the way that you use Warp and Rescue are more important than ever here, in my opinion. Now, yes, I'm not talking about things like low turn count playthroughs for Shadow Dragon's case or anything. Obviously that takes a lot of optimization and strategy. There's no debating that. However, to just simply warp skip a map takes zero effort in Shadow Dragon. Anybody can do it. You could be the newest player in the world. You could pull that off. I guarantee. Here though, instead of being something that can essentially beat a map for you with the click of one button, it's an honest to god consideration with how you want to go about using things like that on any given turn. Because the options are limitless, 
but there are still better options and worse options and the way that the maps are designed complements that sort of thing very well. Personally, I think that they are some of the most fun abilities to use. Not just in Echoes, but in really any game in which they appear. It's always fun to figure out some crazy rescue strategy or some crazy warp strategy. But it would also be better if they didn't instantly defeat any map on the spot, in my opinion. Like I said, there are still good ways to use warp and bad ways to use warp, but... By virtue of the way that the maps are designed, they can be allowed to be used on every single map without breaking any single map, if that makes sense. Would I want every game to be like this? No, absolutely not. But there is fun to be had with this sort of thing. And I think that the way that they chose to go about it actually does make a great deal of sense when you think about it in that light. That's not to say that there's nothing to these maps other than just simple warp and rescue though. Shadows of Valencia relies a lot on your tactical ability. Uh, there's, there's a lot of strategy to it as well, at least in terms of a run like this. But as far as being on the map, it definitely expects you to really understand terrain, how it works, how that interacts with you and the enemy, how you can use it to your advantage to set up positions of power, so to speak, how you can use it to direct the enemy at your own leisure. These are the things that you need to be looking out for when you're actually deciphering a map in this sort of game. This sort of ties into the next point that I wanted to make, which is about the enemy formations, uh, because I think they are quite good and they also complement the map and the gameplay very well for the most part. But to just give you an example of a quote unquote position of power, I guess, there is one tile in the Act 1 endgame from which you can place your lightning sword guy of choice where you can both draw in Slade's group as well as force some of the archers that come with them to attack you at 2 range as opposed to 3 range allowing you to secure more kills and giving you that much more of an advantage when you're actually trying to fight the large group of cavaliers and that's something that I imagine that a lot of players who are less familiar with this game just wouldn't notice because the maps themselves are admittedly visually boring but if you actually take the time to analyze what's going on you'll find that just about every single map in this game has something to that effect there's usually somewhere that you can be that is just that little bit extra than anywhere else that you could be Really the only difference here between this game and any other Fire Emblem game really is like I said it's not much to look at. And the fact that there's not really a clear direction for a lot of players is going to leave them confused if they're not already good at determining this sort of thing for themselves. If you look at a map like the Dragon's Table from Fire Emblem New Mystery I would say that this is sort of the most extreme example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. With a map like this, the direction is clear. It's basically a straight shot from your starting point to the throne room. Every player understands the direction which they must go in order to complete their objective immediately at a single glance. A map in Echoes is much less clear as to what you should be doing, or what you could be doing in order to clear the map the most effective way, I guess I should say. Like I say, it's a single player game, man. You should do whatever you're having fun with, honestly. But at any rate, if you were to take just about any given map in Echoes, really, the game doesn't really give you a whole lot to start with. So the only way that you can effectively clear it is to determine for yourself, based on the enemy's positions, the enemy's formations, etc., etc., what terrain is where, how dangerous a given enemy is, whatever you have to be able to figure all that stuff out yourself because the game isn't taking you in any particular way you know what i mean so even though there's plenty of things you can take advantage of on any given map it's not so obvious because the game isn't necessarily going to force you directly through an advantageous position it's not going to take you directly to where you would like to be and you might not even know where you would like to be unless you take the time to figure it out for yourself. I don't really consider that to be a weakness. Not personally. 
if you didn't already go into a given map, assuming that there would be nothing there, no strategy to be had, then you might honestly start to see a lot of what I'm talking about. You might honestly start to see this game in a different light if you take the time to sit down and really consider what you can and can't do on any given map. And a lot of that has to do with my next point, which is that, for the most part, in this game, the enemy formations are quite solid. And for a game so heavily focused on routing the enemy, that is just so huge. Honestly, it is. Now, I did say that Act 1 is pretty bad. I said that at the start of this video, I definitely meant that, and this is another way that Act 1 sort of fails in my opinion. It doesn't necessarily set up the expectation that there's a whole lot you can do about the way that the enemies are set up. Almost every single one of them is going to involve the enemy coming to you in a very large group, but that really just doesn't hold true for the rest of the game for the most part. Act 2 is kind of eh with it. It's, it's a little bit better. It's not quite at its peak though yet at this point I would say. That has more to do with, with the repetition of having five friggin boat maps. But even then some of the later ones are pretty enjoyable to me. The one with nothing but mages, that one's pretty cool because Again, you can do a lot of the stuff I've been talking about. You can redirect the enemies at your leisure. The formations lend themselves pretty well to being able to do that and pull apart the enemy in such a way that instead of fighting like all eight or nine Arcanists or whatever there are, instead of fighting all of them in one large group, if you're intelligent about how you do things, you can actually pick them apart, so to speak. So you're actually fighting them in much more manageable numbers without really losing any kind of time. And that sort of thing is really fun when you get into it. It's kind of like Awakening in a way where the entire game is based around breaking the enemy formation, except in this game it is much better because the enemies are statted and formed up much more appropriately for what your characters can actually do. Enemy stats are not really inflated in this game. They're just dangerous enough after you get through Act 1 and uh, Act 2 to an extent. Enemies in those acts are very weak, which is, it's strange. It's strange, but it's supposed to be the early game, so whatever really, I suppose. But Acts 3, 4, and 5 feature dangerous enemies that can easily rip apart your units if you're not paying attention. Particularly mages who have no real difficulties destroying your health bar in no time flat at this point. Particularly on Celica's route because you fight a large number of Arcanists and they carry extremely powerful dark magic. Again, resistance does not really exist in this game, so it is very vital that you are able to figure out these enemy formations and how they work. And none of them are unfair. None of them feel like there's just too many enemies for you to deal with. None of them come at you in gigantic waves, again, past the, uh, past the early game, past Act 1. Which, man, it, it, I swear, this game is essentially two different games, but <laughs> I digress. All the enemy formations are placed in such a way to be breakable somehow, if that makes sense. You can always kill, let's say you can always kill one enemy or a group of enemies that makes it safe to advance or makes it safe to deal with the rest of the enemies that maybe are headed your way alongside the first wave or you know something like that hopefully my point is clear the enemy formations in this game if handled effectively are pretty fun to deal with honestly they're powerful enough that they will punish you for blindly rushing particularly again in the case of magic users dread fighters etc etc Something else I've also noticed is that Cantors, probably one of the more <laughs> hated enemy types in the game, without a doubt, tend to be far away, out of reach. And the reason for that is to incentivize you to push through the other enemies and break the lines, break the formations, so that you can just kill the Cantor. Seriously, I, I know I'm not really getting into gameplay stuff like that at this point, but if there was anything to take away from this video, just just kill the Cantor, man. Just, just always kill the Cantor. <laughs> always. 
Tangent aside though, I should probably be clear that even in Act 1 and Act 2, there are some examples of this sort of concept being utilized to pretty good effect. Hell, even the very first map, the Ramwoods Battle or whatever it's called, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but even that one has solid enough formations. Of course, the enemies are very easy at that point, so it's not as though you're forced to really divide and conquer or anything particularly outstanding. Similarly, the first graveyard encounter on Silica's Route in Act 2 is actually a hell of a lot of fun. It's just that the game doesn't make you, <laughs> you know what I mean? It just doesn't make you. But the formations even there are all very logical. There's rhyme and reason to it. It's just that you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. And I understand that not everybody really wants that sort of thing. A lot of players would probably prefer to have a little bit more direction. But overall, there's solid rhyme and reason behind why enemies are the way they are and why they are where they are. So overall, I think that if you're looking to have a good experience with this game, it is within the realm of possibility. It's not a situation like Awakening where, although you're trying to do similar things, right? Like I say, break those formations. It's not a situation where that ever feels like a truly impossible task. It's not a situation where you feel overwhelmed at all times. No, no, no. The game gives you plenty of opportunity to figure out how, when, and where you'll be doing your fighting, which enemies to pull, which direction would be the best to pull said enemy in, how to best divide them up, etc., etc. And when you look at the game that way, things will start to make a lot more sense and maps will have a much better flow to them. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention that I enjoy about this before I get to the actual route that I use for this playthrough that I'm sort of basing a lot of these thoughts on is the fact that I do enjoy that the game does actually attempt to make you pick up your speed a little bit once it comes to the final portions of the game. The Cantors themselves start to become more dangerous, summoning enemies such as Draco zombies at times, which can be a lot nastier than anything that you've really had to face up until that point. Honestly, I will say that I wish that the ads from the Cantors were a little bit more dangerous on the whole. However, like I say, once you get to the Draco zombie guy, they start being decently powerful. And I think that, that incentivizes you to move forward in a meaningful way. Similarly, there is the Mega Quake spell, which admittedly only a few bosses have, but I think that it does a good job of forcing you to move forward in a meaningful way, in a way that every player will understand, basically, because it is potentially lethal if you are too slow and get caught by it. Now, in this playthrough, I don't think... In fact, I know I never saw a Mega Quake because you can completely nullify it by outpacing it, essentially. The bosses that have Mega Quake will only ever use it on certain turns. Now, there is a little bit of variance to it. They can use it one turn sooner than they normally would or one turn later than they normally would sometimes. But you can always kill the boss with Mega Quake before they have a chance to use it. So it gives you that extra little bit of incentive to go out there and make that happen because if you don't, then the implications can be very dire. I think that anti-turtling incentives that punish you with potential death are more effective in getting players to move than by denying them rewards. Now, I understand that that one might be up for a little bit of debate, but from my experience, I've seen many playthroughs where players will totally forgo treasure and things of that nature. Uh, let, like, let's say they were too slow in stopping a thief get to a village, or too slow in stopping a thief get to a chest. I've seen many a player continue on without those, and although there is punishment to that for sure, there is no greater punishment than losing a character in a game like this with permanent death. That in mind, I think that by pressuring the player with the possible penalty of death, 
is much more effective in getting them to really reconsider their options and think outside the box a little bit as opposed to a treasure that they may just continue on without. One final thing, I know I said the last one is final, but this one is final. This will be the last thing I wanted to mention before the end of this part is that I really enjoy personally the fact that this game has such a high skill gap. And I say personally very specifically because I understand that this one will be a little bit more on the fence for people. On one hand, I've already said and definitely stand by the fact that I wish this game would do a better job of teaching players what they can do, what is important, what is not important. Like, I fully admit that. And the game would be much better if more people understood what was really going on here. I'm not saying that every person needs to hyper-optimize their playthroughs or anything like that. I'm so sure that there is a lot of really fun stuff that you can do with other weapons in this game that I maybe did not use for this playthrough. However, <laughs> somebody who can understand what goes into a playthrough like the one that I did would also see a lot of benefit in using the other weapons as well because of said skill gap. If you were somebody who was relatively inexperienced with this title in particular, and you went into it just playing it as if it were any other Fire Emblem game, then your experience with this game would be a whole lot different than somebody who decided to take the game for what it was and do what they can within the context of this game specifically. Not to say that other titles in the series don't have a skill gap, oh no, definitely not. But I think that if I have learned anything over the past week or so, it's that there is a very very noticeable difference in understanding from person to person when it comes to this title specifically. If I told you that Titania was a great Yuna, I don't think that there would be any debate about that and everybody would immediately understand that fact. Now, did we watch the same kill counts that I did? Did you see anybody who maybe stuck out a little bit? Somebody who maybe gets memed on constantly, but actually turned out to be a pretty great unit in all reality? Yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. The, the fact that 99% of people who played this game think that Est is in fact a bad unit is exactly what makes me understand the fact that there's something more to this. There's something going on here where people aren't fully understanding what the game is actually asking from them for one reason or another. Like I say, a lot of that blame can unfortunately be placed on the game doing a poor job of explaining itself. But I think that just goes to show that there's a lot that people don't understand about this game. And there may yet be a lot more that people still don't understand about this game even after this video, myself included. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody came along tomorrow and just blew everything that I'm saying out of the water. That's how much this game has not been explored. Which is why I wanted to create this video in the first place to get that discussion going a little bit, hopefully. That's going to wrap it up for this part at any rate. Next time I plan on going a little bit more in depth as to what I personally ended up doing that made a route like this work. And even if you're not an efficiency nut like I am or anything like that, then you can still learn a lot from this next video as well because the concepts and ideas can still apply to a more laid back playthrough as well. Although... For those hyper curious who maybe want to try and blast through the game the next time they play, maybe unlock that Blitzkrieg medal or something like that before Three Houses comes out, then I think you'll find a lot of the information presented in the next one to be very useful, so look out for that. Tell you what, I'll do you one better. I will put the forging stuff that I did for the entire playthrough in a comment of this video below so that you guys can see for yourself some of what I'm talking about because there is a lot of strategy in this game. I don't want to hear anybody say otherwise. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, I'd be very curious to hear if anybody has a newfound perspective after watching this video. And if you don't, I would and if you don't, I would love to hear why you disagree. Not really a whole lot of discussion on that goes. It seems to be that most people just kind of accept that it is one way when I genuinely think that it might be another. At any rate, I will catch you guys on the next video. See you then. Peace. Oh yeah, like, comment, subscribe.